Morning, everyone. Morning to the visitors and morning to all who are joining us online on Facebook and through Zoom. So yes, last week we had a look at the first section of Jude, um, where Jude basically uh, urges us to contend for the faith. Let's start our reading from verse 17, where there is now a call to preserve, or persevere, rather. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers, following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and the prayer and prayer in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy that the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear hating even the garments stained by the flesh. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and pr to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you once again for the opportunity we have to look into your word and specifically into the, the letter of Jude. Father, help us to heed the lessons learned from last week, to contend for the faith and be mindful of the, uh, the behaviours of false Christianity and false teaching that may creep into our lives. And Father, help us to look forward now to continue to persevere in the faith and realize that we are to show mercy to those who are struggling with that. Father, I just pray that you would bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart and that they may be acceptable in your sight today. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So yes, last week we had the uh, four points, or I've simplified them now down to three, contend for the faith. What is the point of your faith if you do not contend for it? If you do not fight the good fight, if you do not work out your faith, if you do not strive to be more like your savior, savior if you do not endeavor to love him and to know him better, what is the point of it? We also learned that we are to be wary of the behaviors of false teachers and false Christians and to be sure that they have not crept into our lives. We also saw that it is for God to deal with those false teachers and false Christians, not us. We are, however, to rebut falsity, but we should keep in check our own walks, our own lives. But we should always remember that vengeance is the Lord's. So this week, after being told that we should contend for our faith, we are now being told that we need to persevere in the faith. We see in verse 17 and 19, but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following after their own godly passions. It is these who cause divisions worldly people devoid of the spirit. Jude is reminding us that we should be prepared for these people. We should be on our guard against these behaviors so that they don't take hold in our lives. The last times are here. But it's a little strange because the last times were here as soon as Jesus went up to heaven. We read in 1 John 2, 18 to 20, children, 
It is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were... Sorry, it's on the other page. They were not of us. For it has been said of us, they would... If they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are not all of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you have knowledge. In 2 Timothy three, chapter 3, verses 1 and 5, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. We see this today in our world. And sadly, in many Christian churches, we see this in our brothers and sisters. And sometimes we can't even see this in our own lives. These people who love the world more than they love their saviour. They follow after ungodly passions. They say that ungodly passions are okay. But strangely, they swing around and say that godly things are not okay. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. If your focus is on the world, you're not living a proper spiritual life. If your focus is on Christ, you are living a spiritual life and he will reveal things which are spiritually discerned. You will no longer like these passions, these ungodly passions, and you will see the godly things of this world for what they should be. Verse 20 and 21a. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. It's my hope that this message is actually a boon to you, is actually an encouragement to you. Last week we got the stern warning from Jude. This is now the exhortation. We are to, despite all this that we have seen, Live proactively as a follower of Christ. Philippians 2.12 Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Build yourself up in the faith. Who here remembers that old Sunday school hymn? him. Faith is like a muscle. Use it and you will grow. Anyone? You exercise your faith. It will grow. Because the more you trust in God, the more you'll realise how great and gracious he is. But how do we exercise our faith? How do we get those muscles to grow? Well, Firstly, we must submit ourselves to God. James 4, 7 and 8. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse you, your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And again in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, 
by the mercies of God to the presence to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might test and discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The next thing we should do after submitting ourselves to God is to then trust him. In Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. I love this verse because it was drilled into me as a child. <laughs> trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. I don't know about you, but trusting in the Lord seems to be logical. Our God and Father created all that we see. Our brothers and sisters, this very pulpit that I'm standing in, this microphone, the very elements which are in it. He knows how it all works. Why shouldn't we trust him? We should trust even, even more because he sent his son to die for us on the cross. He was willing to give up that which was most precious to him to save a race of people who wanted nothing to do with him. Joshua 1.9 Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Philippians 4, 12 and 13. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Trust in the Lord. If you're feeling weak, if you've had four hours sleep, if you've got a big meeting in the morning, if you've got a big test in the morning, trust God. But trust him in the little things. Trust him as you get in your car and drive to church, drive to work, drive to school even, as you get on the bus, as you get on the train. Trust him with everything. How else can we grow our muscles of faith? Well, it's a good idea to be in the Word. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. How are you going to hear from God if you're not in his scripture? Furthermore, in Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Ever felt unprepared? When someone has come to you and asked you a curly question about what you believe? Be in the Word. Because all Scripture, all Scripture is good for this purpose. Be watchful and on your guard. Now, we have seen this in last week's message and also at the start of this message that we are to be on our guard. We are to stand firm. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous and strong. 
1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. Be alert and of sober mind. Sorry, I'm going a bit quick for you there, Steph. Sorry, mate. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Be alert and of sober mind. Do not be, she'll be right. Do not sit back and rest on your laurels. Be on your guard against false teaching, not just in the church, not just in your Bible study, but in your own life. Examine what you truly believe and line it up against Scripture. One Thessalonians five seven and eight, uh, seven and to nine rather. For those who sleep at night are those who get drunk. Get drunk at night. Sorry. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Be sober, be ready for the return of the Lord, because his salvation is coming. Be ready. Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> Pray in the Holy Spirit. Pray and be submissive to God's will. In Matthew 6, 9 and 10. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See the emphasis there? The emphasis is on God's will, not what you want. But if you're walking in the Lord, your will will be aligned with God's will. Luke 11, 9 and 10. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. What are you asking for? What do you ask God for? What do you seek for? What are you looking for? Is it not for us to seek out the Lord? when his Holy Spirit prompts us to do so. And even if you are a believer, continue to seek him, continue to want to know him more. And James 4 and 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly and spend it on your passions. Anyone remember that uh, old country and western song? Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? I don't know about you, I could probably do with a Mercedes Benz. Or a new bike. You know what I'm on about. <laughs> but these are worldly things. These are worldly passions. These are material things. And if we have ourselves aligned with God's will we are keeping ourselves in the love of God, we will align ourselves to what he wants and what he sees as important. It may be that a new bike is in the plan, but if it isn't, that doesn't mean God's not with you. Verses 21 and 23, God grants us mercy, we see. So we should show mercy to others. 
In the second part of 21, we read, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. It is only the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that ensures eternal life. It is only the mercy through his sacrifice that justifies us, cleanses us, and will eventually glorify us. Ephesians 2, 4 to 7. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love he has, which he has for us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated and raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. Oh, what a saviour that while we were even dead could do nothing for ourselves he takes that first step what mercy that he's showing us that he shows us every day of our lives until we take our final breath that he shows this world right up until he comes again but we are to show mercy like this on those who are having troubles believing it and those who have doubts in their life doubts about who god is doubts in trusting him doubts in knowing how great and gracious he is we should show god's mercy to those who are in doubt because there but for the grace of god goes us in luke 6 36 be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. God was merciful to us and is continuing to be merciful to us. James 2.13 For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. We are to show this love of Jesus, this mercy, to those who are doubting. Or can we truly say that the love of God is in us? We are to help save others by snatching them out of the fire. How many of us have, have spoken to a non-believing friend and have heard that the acts of a believer or an alleged believer have caused them to walk away. Lack of mercy, hypocrisy. But there, but for the grace of God, went us. These people were close to the flames of hell. But God has shown mercy to them. And perhaps that mercy is coming through us. We are the vessel. And it may be that we are the ones that lead them back to Christ. But when you show this mercy, you should be afraid of the sin that so easily entangles. In 1 Timothy Chapter 6, 11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. We are to hate even these things which are associated with sin. Run from them. Don't entertain them. Don't give them a moment's thought. I know it's hard to do because we're bombarded with it every day bombarded with messages of greed, of lust, of me-firstness. But no, we are to live as Christ has called us to. We are to live with Christ first. 
and we are to hate those things which are even associated with sin. In Romans 12, verse 9. Let love be genuine. That is our love to our brothers and sisters. That is our love to God. Let it be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. You've heard it said in today's culture. That's not very loving of you. When we mention someone's faults, their failings, when we mention that they are sinners just as we. But would it not be less loving to let someone continue down their path of error? To let them continue walking on a road which will lead them to a lost eternity? God's grace ensures that we will persevere. His mercy ensures that we will persevere. That mercy that he shows to us day by day and hour by hour will keep us to that final day. And here we have, it's known as the doxology. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, authority, before all time, now and forever. Amen. It is only through the grace of God that we can persevere in faith. We can't do it by ourselves. Have you ever tried to not sin on your own steam? Tell you, you fall flat on your face. Ephesians 2 8 and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared us beforehand, that we should walk in them. That's not to say, it's not to say that we aren't to be without works, that we are not to endeavour to be more like Jesus. But the reason that we're being more like Jesus is not out of a fear. It's not out of a fear of being kicked out of heaven. It's not out of a self-righteousness. It is because we love him and he has saved us by grace. This grace enables us to do this. It changes our perspective off of ourselves and onto him. Philippians 1.6 And I am sure of this, that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion in that day of Jesus Christ. Christ has called you. Trust in him. Because he will continue to form him, you to be more like him. There's three steps to being saved. There's justification, which Jesus took care of on the cross. There's sanctification. Big word, but it basically means becoming more like Jesus. Keeping focused on him, walking towards him despite the big waves that life is throwing at you. And yes, if we do take our eyes off, we put our eyes back on him again. We call out to him, say, Lord, save me. But the final step is when we are taken to be with him. Be it through death or through rapture. Where we are glorified, where this old body, this frail body that we are in is cast off and we are given a new one. And I don't know about you, but I'm saying hallelujah to that. Psalm 138, verse 8. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. God will not forsake us. He will never leave us or forsake us. We see that as Jesus' departing words. As he tells us to go out into the world. 
and to win people for him. To introduce people to a loving saviour. In 1 Peter 5 and 10. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen and establish you. If you fail, trust in God. If you are suffering under a heavy load, trust in God. God because he is able to restore you to strengthen you to confirm you in your faith and to establish you and this is the thing I spoke about being glorified and having that old body of ours this physical body of ours replaced renewed refreshed but our hearts are being refreshed and will be refreshed and we'll be changed. We will be presented blameless as a pure and lovely bride of Christ. In 1 John 3 and 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. In that moment, in a twinkling of an eye, one second from now, one hour from now, seven years from now, maybe even when death takes us, this old body will go. And this old heart, this old sinful heart, which is so prone to disobedience, will go. And it is being replaced as we speak. Ephesians 5, 25 and 27. This is often used for men in regards to how they should treat their wives. But I want us to change our perspective and look at it from Christ's perspective, what he's doing. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her, by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. We can't cleanse ourselves by our own actions. That is not the point of what we're doing when we're trying to follow Jesus. Jesus is the one who cleanses us. He is the one who replaces our hearts and will replace our hearts. He is the one who replaces our sinful body and will replace our sinful body on that day. So that he can present us as his own bride. He loves us that much. I encourage you that if you ever get the chance to look into the rituals of ancient Israel when it comes to marriage. And when you do, keep in mind that this is an image of what Christ does for us. That we do not know the day that he's coming back, but we are to be prepared, we are to be ready. We are to have our bags packed and we may hear him coming from a while off but we don't know when he's coming for us. It is the Father's appointment. And that he is, he's paid for our blemishes. We can't say honestly that we are without sin, without calling God a liar. Except that Jesus has taken our sin and it is on his account, not on ours. In the first two verses of Jude, we read this. To those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Remember this today as you continue out into the world. 
that you are beloved in God the Father and you are kept for Christ Jesus. I hope that this has been an encouragement to you. An encouragement to be on your guard against faith which is fake. Against being a fake news Christian. To persevere in your faith to continue to build it up through Christ. To show mercy to those who are doubting because that could have been you. And to remember that God's grace will ensure that we're able to persevere and that he will keep us for that final day. Let's commit our time in prayer. Father God, how can we not respond in love and adoration to you? After you have gone so far and given up that which is most precious to you to purchase sinners such as us. Father, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you, to persevere till that final day, to trust in you, because you are the one who will carry us through to the end and you will cleanse us from every sin. Father, I just pray that we might remember this during the week and go out rejoicing. Through Christ our Lord, amen.